Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the first episode of our restarted series, The Campaign Trail, our historical podcast with me as host and Eric as guest discussing prominent elections in American history. We're starting off with presidential elections, and we'll be releasing an episode guide soon on Twitter. But we're also interested in looking at campaigns for Senate, campaigns for governor, other close races like that that proved to be interesting over the course of the future. But today we're starting off with the election of 1824. Last year we did the controversial 2000 election. Uh, this election is somewhat similar to the 2000 election with one pretty major deviation. Uh, the similarity deals with the fact that in both elections, the ultimate winning candidate, if you will, lost the popular vote. Uh, the only difference with 1824 is it's the only election uh, in US history where the candidate who won the election did not win a majority of the electoral vote. And on top of that, no candidate won a majority of the electoral vote. However, as I'll note later, it's the second election in U.S. history decided by a contingent vote in the House of Representatives. Uh, so even though the Democratic-Republican ticket in 1800 technically secured a majority of the electoral vote, the 12th Amendment had not yet been proposed or ratified, meaning Aaron Burr and Thomas Jefferson locked at 73 votes each in the Electoral College because the electors could vote for two people for president before then. And that was decided in a, in a contingent election in the House where Thomas Jefferson was chosen. And this was the second and most recent addition, essentially, in which the winner, in this case, John Quincy Adams, was elected in a contingent election in the House. So we'll start off today. This episode is titled Organized Chaos because um, that's pretty much how I would describe the 1824 election. I wrote an episode-based um, article that I just sent to the chat for the Pedagogy Institute on the 1824 election as part of a series uh, on historical relevance of elections in which essentially the winner did not win the popular vote. Um, so why is it significant when we look at 1824? Well, it's significant for multiple reasons, but ultimately I'd say the most important significance about the 1824 election is the fact that no candidate won a majority of the electoral vote. So to go into the background a little bit here, uh, this was a very competitive contest. It was taking part at the end of the presidency of James Monroe. The Federalists had held the White House for essentially five terms at that point, two terms of Jefferson and Madison, and then... Uh, Democratic uh, Republicans. Republicans. The Democratic Republicans. I do mean that. I slipped up. But the, <laughs> yeah, the Federalists only had one president in John Adams. But the Democratic Republicans were essentially coming off of a successful heat of holding the White House. And James Monroe would actually go on to win unopposed in 1820 because the Federalist Party collapsed. Its last nominee was Rufus King, a senator from New York in 1816. And um, generally... The era of good feelings after the War of 1812, which ended in 1815, summed up the Monroe administration. Now, it was briefly interrupted by two prominent controversies that set the stage, not just for the 1824 campaign, if you want to call it that, even though there wasn't a traditional, there wasn't a campaign in the traditional sense. But both of these issues I'm about to describe before I uh, throw it over to Eric and we continue, uh, set the stage arguably for a lot of debate that led up to essentially the Civil War environment about 40, 50 years later. So the first crisis that disrupted the era of good feelings, which essentially is what it sounds like, was the Panic of 1819. And that was the very first economic crisis to really befall the United States at the time. Uh, before Hoover coined the term depression, all of our economic uh, or woeful periods of economic destruction essentially were known as panics. And we had notable panics throughout the 19th the uh, throughout the 19th century. The Panic of 1819 was the first one. Uh, the Panic of 1837 came at the end of Jackson's administration during the transition to the Van Buren administration, and uh, Panic of 1873 as well um, during the middle of the Grant administration. But suffice to say, the Panic of 1819 was caused. I mean, there were quite a few causes. The two main causes that historians from the modern era generally considered to be salient when you're looking at the panic. Uh, first, the overspeculation of lands on the western frontier. You know, the Louisiana Purchase had been completed almost two decades prior to this, but um, still there was rapid expansion westward in the United States, and that continued all the way through essentially to the end of the century, uh, exacerbated under the Polk administration through his commitment to manifest destiny. Uh, but again, the second 
the second real cause of the panic was uh, unregulated flow of currency from the banks, which led to hyperinflation and devalued essentially the American dollar. And this left pretty much all the American workers downtrodden and destitute. It was a very much a brief, but truly tempestuous interruption to an otherwise good period of years, which mind you did uh, continue to the end of Monroe's administration in 1825. Uh, and the second seminal issue uh, dealt with the growth of slavery in the United States. Uh, one slavery-based conflict that grew particularly heated dealt specifically with the admission of Missouri as a slave state. Uh, and this became known as the Missouri Crisis of 1820. So prior to the admission of Missouri, Congress had essentially tried to keep the tensions about slavery between the Northern and Southern factions under control by making sure that at any given time there uh, was an even number of free and slave states in the United States. But admitting Missouri as a slave state would have tipped the balance to the slave faction, which would have upset the established order and caused tensions to seethe between the North and the South, even though we're still far, far, far ahead of the Civil War, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, popular sovereignty, all the other antebellum issues that you remember from history class. Uh, and as a result, and this was an antebellum issue because it was repealed under the uh, decision of Dred Scott versus Sanford, which is the other notable part of that ruling. And that is the Missouri Compromise, which is now famous. And that was created um, in an effort to soothe tensions over slavery before they could boil over indefinitely and could no longer be controlled. So basically what the compromise said was that the state of Missouri would be allowed into the union as a slave state uh, because the new state of Maine would be created as a free state, which would keep the balance even. And the second part of the agreement essentially stated that all future states admitted above Missouri's southern border, the 3630 parallel, would be free, and all states admitted below would be slave. And while this did temporarily quell essentially the tempestuous debate between the two sides, keep in mind the slave trade had been abolished under the Constitution in 1808 by this point, so long off, over a decade prior to this, um, but the compromise did stave off conflict over slavery in the short term, uh, but it didn't do much in terms of uh, balancing the free and slave factions in the long term, which is ultimately why we pretty much just kept seeing politicians kicking the can of slavery down the road, which ultimately led to a boiling point, essentially, at the end of the antebellum war era, which uh, dawned with the Civil War. Uh, and it doesn't take a historian to see that the Missouri Compromise was nothing more than a temporary solution, because if you look at the trends of westward expansion, at the end of the day, there's simply more land above the 3630 parallel than below, which would eventually give the North, the anti-slavery faction, an upper hand over policymaking. Mm -hmm. um, and again, the Missouri Compromise worked for quite a long time. It remained in effect for almost 40 years until, as I mentioned earlier, the 1857 Dred Scott versus Sanford decision overturned it. And that was overseen by Chief Justice Roger Taney, an Andrew Jackson appointee who's now infamous because the Dred Scott ruling is generally considered to be one of the worst Supreme Court decisions in history. It essentially said uh, that, uh, that it's basically said that slaves, even if they were free, so all African Americans in the United States did not constitute citizens and did not have the right, therefore, to sue or bring a suit before a court because they weren't citizens. So it essentially said they weren't human beings and dehumanized them to the point where they couldn't even uh, forge a legal battle against someone else in court. And that was a 6-2 ruling, so very lopsided. At that point, the court was pretty much dominated by Jackson era appointees, Democratic Republican based appointees that had by that time just become full regular Democrats. Uh, and the last thing that you need to know really going into this race, and it's a very important part of the race, there were things called tertium quids. And the tertium, the tertium quids in Latin described the different parts of the Democratic Republican Party. Because the Federalist Party, as I had mentioned, collapsed ahead of the 1820 election and just didn't nominate a candidate. So by 1824, this is uh, after the Federalists, but it's before the advent of the National Republican Party, which eventually became the Whigs, which eventually became the normal Republicans after that party was founded in 1854. So at this point, the tertium quids described the different factions of the Democratic Republican Party. And as I'll explain later, uh, those different factions essentially represented all the ideological differences you had at the time just under one party banner. 
So that's why you had a lot of strife. And again, it's quite fascinating to look at the strife and the candidates, which we'll get into in a second. But that's a general background on it. But it's important to remember that the four major candidates were all part of the same political party, because at this point, mm -hmm. we were in uniparty rule by the Democratic Republican Party that would eventually just become known as the Democrats under Jackson. Uh, so, Eric, I'm not sure if you have any comments on the background here. Uh, after this, we'll go on to the candidates. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because um, if you look at the trend of American politics since basically its entire history, we've always been a two-party country. First was the administration and the anti-administration parties. Even though they weren't really called parties, they were organized under the Washington administration. Then you had the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. And then aside from that brief period after the War of 1812 where there was kind of a – a national unity of sort in terms of goals and objectives that would only last about a decade. Aside from that period, and then, uh, I mean, we've had a two-party system. There's been two parties that have been active at the same time. They've changed over time. The Democrats have been one of the two parties, but you've also had the Whigs the, and then the Republicans and, and among other ones. Even in, you know, under the, uh, I mean, even under uh, previous ones when there was no Democratic Party, when they didn't have a national candidate, they still, there still were two main candidates. So this is a weird period. So this is bound to end. Um, obviously, you had rising Democratic appeal at the time, the idea that a voter should be able to choose their candidate. Keep in mind, this, by this point, uh, many states still chose their candidates. The state legislature chose their candidates. Voters didn't vote for them uh, at the ballot box. They were chosen by the state legislature directly. South Carolina did this until, I believe, the end of the Civil War, where they, where they finally changed to a lot of popular vote. But during this time, there was this rising democratic appeal, the idea that voters should be able to choose who the president of the United States was. What directly led off of this, I think is important to know, is the Congressional Caucus balloting procedure. I don't know if Harrison was going to talk about this, but the, basically, you know, the members of Congress, um, the, you know, the people who were discussing who the nominee of the party should be, they held a vote and not everyone attended. It was kind of deemed undemocratic, but one of the four candidates, William Crawford, who finished dead last in the voting? Yeah, uh, I was in the electoral college. Him. Yeah, he finished uh, first in this vote, and then you know nobody else even got. I mean, all the other candidates got votes, but they got minuscule votes. It was like ninety-eight to one if you look at the percentage. So that's the other thing here is this conflict between this existing system where the state legislatures were deciding, and still in many states, uh, who to vote for. He found women couldn't vote at this time. Many states had allowed for blacks to vote. And not all white voters could vote either. Some of them required property owners or other things along this time. The universal suffrage, at least to, to males, was not a thing yet. So that's the Jackson other problem actually, here. Eventually, when Jackson came into office, part of the Jacksonian Democratic platform was making sure there was universal suffrage for white men, which at mm -hmm. the time was a big reform. And I know it sounds trite today when you think about yeah. it. But back at this point, pretty much... Prior to the 1824 election, there was a popular vote, but it was just so minuscule. And that's something I'm going to talk about. 1824 mm -hmm. was a boom in terms of the popular vote with more white men actually being able to vote than ever before. And again, I know mm -hmm. it sounds frivolous, but prior to this, essentially, you had only the richest white landowners who had great influence over their communities and the political happenings in their states had votes that mattered in the popular vote. And arguably mm -hmm. before this, the Electoral College was all that mattered, not the popular vote in any way, shape or form, because... Even in 1824, you had about a third of the states still selected the winner or basically who to attribute their electoral votes to at the state legislative level. So, mm -hmm. again, Georgia, state legislative, South Carolina decided by the legislature. Very few states actually had a popular vote that would essentially determine who the electors would pledge their votes to. So we were in infancy in that regard. Um, so. Yes, it was an oligarchy. American politics, 1824 <laughs> and 1828 were the elections that helped break the American political oligarchy. So, uh, and then to answer this question, like I said, the Federalists were dead by 1824. They were all dead. All of the ex-Federalists that were still in politics had become members of the Democratic Republican Party. But the different tertium quids, the different factions within the party, really, really represented those ideological differences that had previously existed. And they weren't all running, they were under the same party, but they were all separate tickets. So there were four mm -hmm. separate tickets in total. So I guess this is a good time to go into the candidate. And I, I would mention one more thing. One more thing with this is that one, I'm not sure if the ballots actually listed party on them. That would be kind of no, redundant, and especially back then. But they also n not all candidates appeared in every state. North Carolina, John Quincy Adams and Henry Clay weren't on the ballot. Well, it's, Kentucky, just like, it's just like 1860. Abraham Lincoln wasn't on the ballot anywhere in the South. 
Yeah. So even, you know, even in some states, you only would have two choices or you'd have if they even had a popular vote at all. States like New York, the biggest state in the country at the time, didn't have a popular vote. Nope. Um, that's major. That is a substantial a number of electoral votes, 36, and you need 131 to win. So that's almost, you know, that's a pretty substantial portion of those votes right there that are just decided by the legislature. And again, just for people that don't realize, there have been four elections in which the winner did win an electoral majority, but lost the popular vote. 1876, 1888, 2000, and 2016. We've done 2000. It was our only episode prior to this, but we will be looking at those other elections. 1824 is unique and even different from 1800, as I mentioned, because even though both 1800 and 1824 were decided in contingent elections in the House, in 1800, the combined Democratic-Republican ticket, if you will, still bested the Federalists in the electoral vote. So the ticket still procured a majority. It's just that this was pre-12th Amendment, which we'll discuss later when we talk about the contingent vote, meaning that electors did not distinguish between vice president and president, which is why the second place finisher in the election would often become vice president prior to the 12th Amendment, because these were tickets, but they were really pseudo tickets because... Aaron Burr was supposed to be Thomas Jefferson's running mate. And even though they beat the Federalists combined, they tied electorally because electors could vote twice. So that's what essentially created the 12th Amendment, which mm -hmm. laid in stone, set in stone, the way by which presidents would be determined if there were no electoral majority. So with that, let's get into the candidates. So fascinating looking at the candidates. And keep in mind, this is coming off of an 1820 election where you had no candidates, essentially the first and currently the only other unopposed election since Washington. So Washington, both his terms were essentially unopposed and Monroe's reelection was essentially unopposed. Yeah. Um, there's a similar situation with Grant's reelection in 1872. He was up against Horace Greeley, but Greeley uh, died before the election, before the electoral college could convene, I should say. So the opposition vote ended up being splintered between many, many, many Democrats. But the yeah. candidates in this election, there were four. Uh, the first one was Secretary of State John Quincy Adams, who had served at this point for eight years under the Monroe administration. And keep in mind, the Monroe administration, if you remember anything about the Monroe era from history, besides the era of good feelings, is probably the Monroe Doctrine, which was a signature foreign policy achievement uh, that was so influential that John Tyler used it when he was president to essentially stake a claim to the Pacific in Hawaii as well, because previously it had applied to Latin America uh, in the sphere of influence of the United States, saying Europe can keep your hands off of the Americas in general. And Tyler applied that to the Pacific, which allowed, under the Cleveland administration, us to acquire Hawaii. So that all can be related back to the Monroe Doctrine, which is work that was undergone uh, under Secretary of State John Quincy Adams. It's also yep. notable because prior to this election, and this technically held up, although we'll talk about the controversy later, every Secretary of State in the previous Secretary in the previous President's administration had gone on to become President up to this point, uh, which is why Henry Clay would become Secretary of State under the Adams administration. And we'll talk about the corrupt bargain later, but essentially it was, I'll whip the votes for you because I'm House Speaker. In return, I become Secretary of State, which puts me in line to the presidency. Ultimately, Clay lost three presidential elections, and the trend died with him. But yeah. he was Speaker of the House. Uh, the third candidate— I, I do want to mention one thing with John Quincy Adams, because he's a really interesting figure. Um, before I'm um, Basically, everything you said is, is absolutely accurate. I would note that while Quincy Adams is regarded as a fairly mediocre or average president at best, someone who was kind of thwarted by Congress in a lot of ways— in terms of diplomacy, he's widely regarded as one of the greatest secretaries of state in American history and one of the best diplomats, period. It's kind of like John Adams in that regard. Mediocre president, really, really good diplomat, someone who was really, really good in, in that sort of executive position, but ultimately kind of faltered in the presidency, for lack of a better, a, a better term. But he's well regarded uniformly for all of his accomplishments. And I mean, again... Adams had that same diplomatic experience and he raised his son with that experience as a boy. He brought his son with him to Europe mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the uh, 18th century. He brought his son with him to Europe when they toured in Russia and France. And he got to meet and learn from his father on diplomatic issues, essentially. And he held those close to him for the rest of his life. And he would be a diplomatic voice in the House. He's one of the few presidents who, after losing reelection, after just a single term, returned to Congress as a member of the House. And he served there till he died. 
But yes, like his father, not too successful in the presidency, both one-term presidents. But we'll get to that. The third candidate is someone you all know, Andrew Jackson, who had been chosen as a senator from Tennessee, the very state that nominated him for president. Uh, and the final candidate is Treasury Secretary William Crawford, who granted was presiding over what was a very tenuous treasury at the time, kind of bare bones treasury until the Polk administration. Uh, but once again, he never really had a good relationship with President Monroe, as you'll learn later. And the traditional congressional caucus, the method by which all of the past Democratic Republican nominees have been chosen, had really lost meaning by this point in American history. The fifth candidate that ended up not running was John C. Calhoun, who went on to be vice president under Quincy Adams and Jackson. Uh, and he was the war secretary at the time. And he proved to be a pretty good mediator during the South Carolina nullification crisis over whether or not portions of the Constitution could just be nullified uh, during the 1829 onset of Jackson's presidency after he eventually did make it to the White House. But Calhoun decided to drop out of the race because he would get the vice presidential slot on the Jackson and the Adams tickets. And he felt that was a pretty sure bet of getting to victory, even though, as we'll note at the time, both Clay and Adams who were running on the same Adams Clay Republican tertium quid platform. They both thought that the Jacksonians had little to no chance in the election. So I think that's important to note. There were three ideological alliances, the Jacksonians, the Adams Clay Republicans and the old Republicans, the old Republicans, that was the Crawford faction that had been chosen through the Congressional Caucus. Now, theoretically, if Adams or Clay had decided to drop out and thereby make sure that only one candidate was running under the Adams-Clay Republican faction, then they almost certainly would have acquired enough support to get 131 electoral votes and beat Jackson. So in a way, their mutual underestimation of Andrew Jackson's importance and Andrew Jackson's support mm -hmm. with the public and their own essentially fighting match, even though they were allies that ripped essentially the opposition vote in half, prevented one unified person from that wing of the Democratic Republican Party from stopping Jackson. So the Jacksonians, as the name implies, banded together to support Old Hickory. Uh, and at this time, campaigning in the modern sense hadn't developed at all. So there wasn't a traditional presidential campaign per se even as late as William McKinley in 1896, candidates were running front porch campaigns and William Jennings Bryan, uh, the youngest presidential nominee up to that point, although he ultimately lost, really pioneered the stump speech, going about and speaking and going all over the country. He did thousands of speeches across the country, but at this point it very much was a front porch campaign and we wouldn't really even see any campaign literature, attacks or anything major really developing until the 1828 campaign which was particularly brutal on Jackson and really strained. Uh, in fact, in 1832, as you know, I mean, Jackson came to hate Henry Clay. So Henry Clay's second bid for president was 1832. And the relationship between him and Jackson soured to essentially non-existent after that because Jackson's wife passed away during that campaign and he blamed Henry Clay and the uh, essentially the new Whig Party's attacks uh, mm -hmm. for bringing about his own wife's death. But if you don't know, Jackson was the hero of the Battle of New Orleans, which was the very last battle of the War of 1812. Now, to be fair, the Treaty of Ghent that ended the War of 1812 had been signed in Europe before the Battle of New Orleans occurred, but obviously since this is before the advent of telegraph technology or any real form of communication, the uh, troops that were on the ground in the Americas did not know that the war had already been ended. So technically peace had already been met in Europe as this battle was occurring, but it was still viewed at the time as a final punch that said adios to the British and their invasionary force, which was essentially forced out. And uh, Jackson really had a very strong patriotic image just from this battle. Uh, unlike his opponents, he didn't have much in the way of political experience that he could utilize to supplement the public's perception of his presidential worthiness. But as we've come to realize throughout history, and as you'll realize throughout these episodes, sometimes experience is not the main factor when the public chooses a candidate. If they have popular appeal or a record as a military general, that often is far more appealing. So I have a good quote here from Professor Daniel Feller. He's a professor at the University of Tennessee, and um, he writes for the Miller Center at the University of Virginia, which has brilliant articles on history and presidents and campaigns throughout our country's um, 
winding path of historical oddities. And um, his article was called Andrew Jackson, Campaigns and Elections. So it talked about his uh, 1824 bid and 1828. And he says wisely, compared to Jackson's opponents, Jackson had scanty qualifications as a statesman with only brief and undistinguished service in Congress as a territorial governor, where all presidents since Washington had served extensive administra administrative and diplomatic apprenticeships Jackson had never held a cabinet post or even been abroad. He was also criticized for not speaking any foreign languages. And as I mentioned earlier, ultimately, Jackson's dearth of experience didn't prove detrimental at all to his national appeal. And Fuller later notes, on the other hand, his heroics as a general had a far greater hold on the public imagination than the governmental experience of his competitors. So though he did not ultimately prevail in the 1824 contest, he did go on to win in 1828 and 1832, and his successor in 1836, Martin Van Buren, was essentially his policy clone. And ultimately, Jacksonian democracy influenced what then transitioned from the Democratic Republican Party to the Democratic Party and essentially governed the way the Democratic Party would operate on a policy standpoint for almost the rest of the century, which makes Jackson easily one of the most influential Democratic presidents of the time. It's also important to note that there have been similar general term presidents who rose to unlikely stardom after using their wartime recognition at catapult under the highest office in the free world. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant is a notable one, two-term Republican president after the Civil War. Dwight Eisenhower, another two-term Republican president after World War II. Both, both very fascinating stories. And Andrew Jackson was really the first person to use military experience and national stardom, a powerful image to boost himself into the White House. Uh, Eric, do you have anything at all to say um, about Andrew Jackson? Any opinion? Yeah, I mean, I'm not a big fan of him as, as a president. I don't think his experience is necessarily wanting, although it is interesting to note today that it's very rare for a president now to be able to speak multiple languages. Back then, you know, having someone who could speak multiple languages is actually a pretty important qualification when interfacing with other governments, you know, with uh, with Spain or with, with France in particular, who would have been too... Uh, two countries to you know close negotiations. Chris Adams was the peak statesman, so yep. So you know that's an interesting that's an interesting divide. Um, obviously, we'll go into the 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 results of this, but it's it's regardless of your opinion on Andrew Jackson, it's very difficult to say that his actions as president and as a candidate did not impact the the sh the you know the the path that the United States went on throughout the rest of uh, throughout our history to this very day. He's still on the twenty dollar bill. He's still regarded you know fairly decently in terms of his, his presidency although it's obviously taken a substantial hit as people have reconsidered some of the abuses but it, it's difficult to un to understate how important of a figure andrew jackson was mm -hmm. and uh the second faction here again the adams clay republicans they were jackson's most credible opposition and mm -hmm. both adams and clay ran under this alliance but as I mentioned earlier, much to their mutual regret, neither of them took Jackson's bid in earnest during the campaign. They pretty much held it as a joke campaign that would not be successful. Uh, and without the benefit of hindsight, the two experienced statemen just simply didn't expect much of Jackson. And um, I presume ultimately they expected their faction between their two combined tickets would easily defeat the Jacksonian faction, when in reality, by running two candidates uh, themselves under the same faction, it just essentially split the opposition vote. Uh, now, Adams, as we mentioned earlier, was the son of John Adams, a one term president, and he had been a very, very important Secretary of State, definitely the most important to the time and one of the most important since under Monroe's term. And as I mentioned, with the traditional precedent, that would make him the heir to the presidency because every previous president had been Secretary of State and their predecessors administration, the administration of their forecomer. Um, but Clay, on the other hand, was also talented, the Speaker of the House. He was known for being a brilliant, brilliant orator. Everything he uttered was held in high regard. He was a noted reformer. He went on to champion the Whig Party. And um, ultimately, though he was never successful in attaining the presidential office he had always so dearly sought, he went on to be known as the Great Compromiser. I mean, he was someone that helped negotiate the, the uh, Missouri Compromise. And he was somebody who went on and saw the ends of the antebellum era right before the Civil War, before his death. Um, mm -hmm. Again, both men had strong presidential ambition, but Clay, unfortunately for him, could never succeed, even though he did ultimately uh, 
but come Secretary of State, the precedent just simply didn't work out uh, in 1832 when he tried to fulfill the precedent. It did not pan out well for him, and he lost mm -hmm. to Jackson. And that was the last election as a national Republican in 1832. After that, the party became the Whig Party, uh, which would eventually go on to become the Republican Party as we know it today. But he ran in 1844 again as a Whig, but he lost. Um, uh, and the final fact... Yeah. Yeah, if you have anything to say about them, and then we'll talk about. I was that. just saying to forty-four to North Carolina's own uh, uh, President Polk, who is a. But I'm basically Clay had very poor luck running for president, and but he's still yeah. regarded as a as a monumental figure in American politics in a way that he he would have certainly been regarded more highly if he had become president. But you can't really again like with Jackson, you can't understate the importance of him as a political figure. Certainly one of the giants of of his time. And Polk was effective too, very, very, very effective as a president. Again, some people are have mixed views on Polk because of Texas annexation of Manifest Destiny and the Mexican-American War. But in terms of a president setting out with an agenda in a single term and willingly stating they're only serving a term and accomplishing their agenda, Polk is still remembered to this day for being essentially the last effective president until Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in our upcoming series where we cover each president or groups of presidents. And that'll be coming out. We'll have more information next week on that. But the third faction of the Democratic Republican Party at this point was the old Republicans. And um, these individuals back Crawford, who I mentioned earlier, was the Treasury Secretary under Monroe. And he secured the nomination in the traditional Democratic Republican faction, which I mentioned earlier and Eric mentioned earlier, the Congressional Caucus. And this had been fine for choosing the party's nominee back when they were a unified party. It was held in high regard, but uh, it essentially did not function properly under the splinter Democratic Republican Party. And I have another quote from Fuller because I think it's important. So Professor Fuller says, once seen as a necessary device for ensuring victory, the caucus now seemed a gratuitous intrusion upon the popular will, which Eric mentioned, a means to deprive voters of any meaningful choice at the polls. A poorly attended caucus nominated Crawford in 1824 but his consequent image is the insider's choice rather harm than help his chances. And honestly, in an election year where a populist outsider like Andrew Jackson ascended to the White House as the public's favorite, I highly doubt Crawford would have had any appeal as an insider. The national environment simply wasn't ready for that to resonate well with the electorate. Mm -hmm. But besides that disadvantage, Crawford arguably had the worst relationship out of all the candidates with his own boss and the head of the Democratic Republicans, President Monroe. Uh, another very intelligent woman, Margaret Hogan, in her article, John Quincy Adams campaigns and elections for the Miller Center. She also works at the Historical Society in Boston, which maintains the John Adams Museum. And she described the scale of the Crawford temper, stating his main drawback stemmed from his explosive temper which had alienated a number of fellow political leaders, including President Monroe. The two men had almost engaged in a fist fight in a cabinet meeting before Crawford gathered his wits enough to apologize. And ultimately all of that put together with the fact that it was not a year for insiders cost Crawford the election. He came in last place. Um, in now, the popular vote. He did finish slightly ahead of Clay in the electoral, but popularly he was popular. He popular. came in last place, which is my point, because we're talking about public enthusiasm, and he was the mm -hmm. one the public was least enthusiastic about. So we get to the results now, and as the results were tabulated, one of the big things that I mentioned earlier was that it became clear that voters had turned out in vast numbers, numbers that had simply never been seen before. The total number of popular votes cast was 365,833, and that was way more than any presidential contest up to that point, which is why 1824 is generally considered, for the most part, to be the first election in which the popular vote had somewhat of a sway, some influence. But the strong popular vote was not the only takeaway from the results. Uh, it was also the first and only time in U.S. history, as we noted, that no candidate secured a majority in the electoral vote, or no ticket, I should say. Because again, the 1800 election was decided in a contingent race, but the Democratic Republican ticket, if you can call it that, beat the Federalist ticket in the Electoral College. But Jackson did have the most popular appeal, and he he won the he didn't win a majority; he won a plurality of the electoral vote and the popular vote, which easily reflected that. He took 99 electoral votes; he needed 131 to win. Adams finished in second with 84. Crawford finished narrowly ahead of Clay in the electoral count. 
with 41, and Clay got 37. The popular vote's far more reflective of the public's opinion at this point. Jackson took 41.4%, far ahead of his nearest opposition from Adams, who took only 30.9%. And then Clay finished 13, and Crawford in last with 11.2%. And part of the reason why Crawford managed to get that electoral majority was the state of Georgia, which again, was one of the states that did not have a popular advantage. Popular, The popular vote didn't matter. There was no popular vote. Mm-hmm. Legislature determined how the electoral votes were allocated. And Virginia was another big state. So it's kind of deceiving to see that he didn't finish in last in the electoral vote. If there had really been a popular vote, he very much, he very well could have finished last by that metric. Uh, but Eric, do you have any takeaways from just the turnout and how it impacted future elections? Yeah, it definitely changed things. I mean, Jackson clearly had a broad coalition. If you looked at the map, Adams, this was kind of limited just to the core Northeast, the most uh, the most insidery area, you could say, the the port city around New York and the state of New York, all of New England as well was in favor of him. But the only other places he got electoral votes from were from Illinois and from Louisiana. He got two in, two in Louisiana and one in Illinois. Uh, Clay's support came basically just from around Kentucky, Ohio, Kentucky, and Missouri. That's where the three states he got electoral votes from. And then Crawford's was kind of limited to a couple in New York, a couple in Delaware, and then Georgia and Virginia, which Virginia is a big state at the time. Very, very big state. The biggest. If you look at, yeah, one of the, I mean, New York was, New York had larger population or, or actually. Electorally, I, Virginia was the prize for a while. Yeah. I'm trying to think it probably had a larger population if you had counted. Yeah. I would need to figure out how that, because the, obviously for a portion, they didn't count sl- enslaved Americans as. Uh, full citizens, which obviously impacts the electoral apportionment. So what could well be, have been the largest state, but Jackson's was widespread. He had support in Pennsylvania, in New Jersey, in Maryland. He had support in some of the territories, Indiana, Illinois, his home state of Tennessee, where he won almost all of the popular vote, like 99.7% of the popular vote. Uh, North Carolina as well, which is my home state. He did very well in North Carolina. He got 56% of the vote there, probably in large part because of its proximity to Tennessee, and we do claim him as a president, if I recall, right? We, we claim um, three presidents. We claim Jackson, we claim um, Polk, and we claim Johnson. And we do have a statue of all three of them in the state capital of North Carolina. So he, he did win North Carolina, although by a narrower margin than you would expect, you know, given uh, the, the local the local appeal. Like if you look at the map, it's, it was a two-party race there between him and between Adams, who did very well in the eastern portion of the state, specifically around places which we would now call – Forsyth County around Wilmington, the largest city in the state at the time, in all likelihood. So, you know, basically the, the big thing here was that Jackson had a big coalition. He had a big coalition of voters and a big coalition of states. He even won a few states that that chose their electors at the state legislature. He didn't only win popular states. He did win a handful of states that didn't. Uh, he won New York and he or he won one elector in New York. He won eleven votes in South Carolina, which is all of the votes there and he won several in Louisiana. So even in states where he didn't have a chance to win the popular vote, he did still did get in some of them. Um, mm-hmm. at least in half of them, he got some or all of the electors. So, you know, a really impressive performance for, and, uh, for Jackson. And if you look at elections at the time, like back then, again, there was no normal campaign. So regional coalitions were really all that it took to win an election. And they were, it's hard to really note, in the modern era, just how critical the different regional support bases were Mm -hmm. uh, when it came to actually determining election outcomes. Because before modern campaigning, it would be difficult for candidates to spread a wide message. Someone like Jackson had nationwide name recognition. But Mm -hmm. again, Fuller keenly notes, um, he discusses regional bases in his article, and he really just summarizes what um, Eric just talked about. So he, he says, candidacy is built on a regional base. Adams was the favorite in New England, which panned out. Jackson in the Southwest, Clay in the Ohio Valley, Crawford in his native Virginia. Following tradition, the candidates did not actively seek votes or make promises. Jackson and Adams were generally understood to support the current Monroe administration, Crawford despite his cabinet post, and Clay to oppose it. In the end, these presumptions about regional support ended up being pretty accurate. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jackson did sweep the South and managed to win Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Indiana. Adams won New York and the ex-Federalist Haven of New England. Crawford took the grand prize in Virginia, his birthplace, and his adopted home state of Georgia. And Clay won his native Kentucky in a landslide, but also took Ohio and Missouri, 
other close Ohio River Valley states. And some of the hardest battles were fought on the Western frontier between Clay and Jackson because they both in some way had a stake on the greater Ohio River Valley. But as soon as the results were evaluated and certified, two things became clear. One, Clay and Adams, even though they had small disagreements over the Monroe administration, were still running under the same tertian quid. They had both grossly underestimated the scale of Jackson's popular appeal, almost ridiculously. And two, the outcome would be decided in 1825 in a contingent election in the House. But before we can discuss that, I want to talk about the 1800 election, the only other race decided by the House and the 12th Amendment that governed essentially in 1824 how an election and the contingent nature was conducted. Uh, so but before 1804, the 12th Amendment didn't exist. As a result, presidential contests were essentially chaotic free-for-alls, um, and it was in fact the chaos of the 1800 election that precipitated the creation and eventual ratification of the now famous amendment. It takes two-thirds to get an amendment through both chambers of Congress, and then three-fourths of the states have to ratify it, or you can go through the other method that's never been used of essentially having the states petition for a constitutional convention. Back then, the popular vote held little sway, and the Electoral College was paramount. And at this point in American history, in our story, as I mentioned earlier, the electors would cast two votes each, and they wouldn't make a distinction between the votes cast for president and those cast for vice president. So though these tickets were fielded by each party in 1800, they weren't presidential tickets in what we would consider the modern sense. So back then, in general, a second place finisher in the Electoral College count, regardless of their party, would automatically become vice president. So after the ratification of the amendment, the vice presidential nominee on the winning ticket would assume the office, not the losing candidate. Um, so in 1800, President Adams was seeking re-election after a tumultuous, fairly unpopular presidency. Um, you had the XYZ affair occur during his administration. You also had the quasi war with France occur during his administration. Mm -hmm. And you had the Alien and Sedition Act, not Wilson's version of the Alien and Sedition Act, but the first ever version of the Alien and Sedition Act attempted to quell pro-French forces in the United States and prevent any criticism of the president and his policies during the quasi-war. And that ended up being incredibly controversial, to put it lightly. Um, so the Adams ticket ended up losing re-election, which consigned him to be the first one-term president at the time, even though he was only the second president. And Interestingly enough, the first one-term president until his son, John Quincy Adams, and the only Federalist president in U.S. history. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, though, it was the tie between the Democratic-Republican nominee, Jefferson, and his quote-unquote running mate, Aaron Burr, who you all know for assassinating Alexander Hamilton uh, in a duel, if you want to call it an assassination, brought about the real controversy. So both individuals tied 73-73 in the Electoral College vote. Even though the Democratic-Republican ticket as a whole, led by Jefferson, did beat the Federalists in the raw electoral count. Since the 12th Amendment had not even come into existence at the time, the tie could not be resolved without a challenge. So 36 ballots were cast in the House and counted in the contingent election. And at the end of that long tirade of 36 arduous ballots, the end of consistently fervent debate growing ever more arduous, Jefferson was able to exceed the nine state delegation votes that he needed to win the presidency. And during his first term, the 12th Amendment was tacked onto the Constitution, which set the groundwork for the 1824 election. So following the provisions of the new amendment, the president would still be elected in a contingent election held by the House, but the vice president would be chosen by the Senate. Ironically, Jackson's opponents might have been able to win, as I mentioned earlier, but you know, you can't change history. So that's about as simple as it goes. Mm -hmm. But I think um, before I talk to Eric about uh, the provisions of the 12th Amendment, Amendment itself and the ultimate vote to elect John Quincy Adams, we need to clear up for our audience and for everyone how the contingent elections work, because there's a lot of confusion. Yes. So in a contingent election, like today, we have 435 members of the House and we have for almost a century had that many members of the House has been locked. But each individual member does not have their vote count in the traditional sense. So, for example, there wouldn't be like 218 votes cast for Trump to determine he would be the president if there were an electoral tie. Mm -hmm. uh, it's based on state delegations. So the majority of each congressional delegation from each state functions as one single vote. So, for example, in 1824, 25 Pennsylvania representatives backed Jackson and one backed Adams. So that would be a clear majority, and that would force – 
that state delegation to be allocated as one vote for Jackson. So in the modern era with 50 states, you would need 25 delegations to win. The vice presidential vote works the same way, except it's cast by Senate delegations. So the two senators would have to agree on who they would cast their votes for. It would need to be 26, by the way, because there would be 20. In, in, in 18, yeah, in 1825, the number of states necessary to win was 13. So it was less. Mm -hmm. uh, but John yeah. Quincy Adams became the second member of the Adams family to secure that election after winning exactly the 13 delegations that he needed. And today he's the only man in U.S. history to have been elected president without winning either an electoral majority or the popular vote. So mm -hmm. Jackson was shocked by his loss. He felt great anger over the outcome. In many respects, he, along with his supporters, perceived the presidency as having been stolen from his grasp. He was particularly critical of the contingent election because he viewed it as unfair. And this perception of a quote-unquote nefarious vote has since become known as the corrupt bargain. And to just conclude before I talk about this with Eric and we wrap up the episode, the corrupt bargain starts off like this. The House is governed essentially by House Speaker Henry Clay, heavily influential, holds as much sway over the House as anyone at that point. And he was one of Jackson's bitter lifelong enemies. And that enmity essentially became worse over time, particularly during the 1832 campaign. But Clay, and again, obviously he never came out and stated that this happened, but Jackson's argument was that Clay had agreed to procure the necessary votes to ensure that an Adams victory in the House occurred by getting enough state delegations. And in turn, Adams promised to make Clay his Secretary of State, a position he was certainly qualified for, but Jackson viewed it as unfair because up to that point, as I mentioned, every single Secretary of State in the previous president's cabinet had gone on to become a president, including Adams, and Clay was hell-bent on getting to the presidency, even though he never did. So after the House victory, the suspicions were confirmed. He was nominated and confirmed as Secretary of State by the Senate. Unlike his predecessors, though, ultimately, he did not win in 1832 or 1844, and Jackson unseated uh, President Adams in 1828. And so the 1824 contest, as tempestuous as it was, was brought to an end on that ruling note. Uh, and ultimately, Jackson vindicated himself, and most people consider it vindication given his victory four, year, four years later. Mm -hmm. And a lot like Polk, for better or worse, and even Andrew Johnson, if we want to add him to the list, he was an important president and that what he did was significant, for better or for worse, although most people nowadays would argue for worse, but still a notable president. It doesn't mean that he was a good president because he was notable. Andrew Johnson was an awful president, but he's still notable for the lasting damage he did during the Reconstruction era. So, Eric, do you have any concluding thoughts about this election? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting case study because, uh, like, basically, keep in mind, only the top three candidates could be chosen from. Clay was eliminated right off the bat. So his his supporters, it would be assumed his states would go towards himself, and then you'd have the other ones going towards them. For as much as the Jacksonians felt this was a, was a rigged game, later analysis have shown people looking back at voting records of – of representatives and how they would do that it actually kind of coincided more with sincere voting as it's called as in they voted for their second or third favorite choice instead of their first favorite if their first choice was clay they voted for the second choice which was whoever clay had endorsed uh certainly jackson would have been towards the bottom of that list although he did finish with seven states which is not terrible that's still 30 percent of states uh he i mean he won many of them were ones that he had won um you know so really the way i look at it is it certainly looks bad. The optics are bad, especially with the popular sentiment rising. I think it was overblown, but the complaints of it certainly worked when he was elected. Uh, I do question impugning the, you know, the judgment and the honesty of Henry Clay and of John Quincy Adams uh, accusing them of stealing an election is a big deal. I don't think there's the evidence for that. And obviously if Clay had not been eliminated, I think he would have made a harder push for himself for president instead of for, Adams, if, for example, he had won one more state than Crawford did, he would have been able to surpass Crawford in the electoral vote. It would have been the top three would have been Adams, Jackson, and Clay. That's actually an interesting counterbalance. Who does it go to in that case? Does the – because the Adams-Clay people, as you mentioned, are generally aligned. They're generally very similar in terms of what they believe. Do they team up against Jackson? Do they go with – you know, do they go with Adams who had the more most support? Or do they go with Clay – who was known to the people of the House. It's an interesting question because um, th there's a lot of ways to look at it and a lot of ways to game this out that that are 
that this contingent election, which is honestly kind of poorly designed, really leads to. Uh, there's a lot of potential issues with this contingent election. We had discussed this, I believe, in 2016 and 2020, the possibilities of a of a 269 to 269 tie. You could get an, an a tied House delegation could lead to some major, major problems. So there is a structural issue with this as well, I think. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And then ultimately, as we wrap up, we can just look at the some of the questions here. So um, threat of the Civil War from this? Well, if you study... 19th century history, the threat of the Civil War just kept brewing. Essentially, we just mm -hmm. kept staving it off every so often, but the threat itself was still brewing, and it eventually boiled over into one sodden mess, and that became the Civil War. So we'd have to wait until the 1850s to really have some of the big causes that finally brought about the war, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, the debate over popular sovereignty, but the Missouri Compromise, which had just been formed, was a big issue in 1824. Uh, I don't want to imagine if we still had runner-up vice president. <laughs> I don't want to think about that. Uh, that would be very yeah. awkward. You'd have Vice President Trump deciding votes in a 50-50 Senate. <laughs> yeah, I know. It would be kind of ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> and then if I were Jackson, I would have been furious. I would have been furious too. And Jackson used that fury to bring about kind of the earliest form of campaigning in a traditional yeah. sense and launch himself into the White House. Yeah, an mm -hmm. extended four-year revenge campaign against the Adamses and the Clays and pretty much everyone else in politics. I mean, it's not wrong when you look at Jackson. His biggest regrets were not shooting Henry Clay and hanging John C. Calhoun as vice president. <laughs> this is a man that was shot in the chest during a duel and kept walking and then shot his opponent. Yeah. And carried the bullet with him for the rest of his life. I know it sounds like it's too good to be true, but with that... We're going to be wrapping up this episode of the campaign trail. You can join us again next week and also join us again on Mondays going forward. We're going to have a new series that reviews different presidents. And we're going to get to all of the presidents throughout the rest of this year into next year. So I think you guys are really going to enjoy it. We're going to have weekly episodes of the campaign trail and weekly episodes of our ranked show called ranked. The president's essentially ranked, which is going to be great. So uh, Eric, do you have anything else to say? Yep. Yeah, um, if you uh, if you like what we're doing, be sure to subscribe to the channel. Uh, if you're listening to this in audio form, you can subscribe to us wherever you get your podcast. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can click the subscribe button and click the bell icon to get notified whenever we we go live. Uh, we're doing more stuff, obviously, along with our election coverage. If you really like what we're doing, we have a Patreon you can follow. Um, we have different tiers. We have a Discord server and some other things you can get in. We'll answer your questions there. We do that fairly often. Um, but yeah, that uh, you know. Follow us at electionsdaily.com and uh, on Twitter at elections underscore daily. Yep. Thank you, everyone, and good night. See you next week.